Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bay Presbyterian Church. It's good to see you. Always want to say that like the college professor who writes the name of the course up on the board when you walk in, just to make sure you're in the right class. We're glad to have you here. Now, welcome to you one and all. We're especially glad to have visitors with us today, as always. And we have special guests with us as you have been enjoying their playing. We're grateful to have Gloria Gully back on the piano with us. And we also are glad to have, and please forgive me if I don't get these names right, but Amanda and Aitor and Aiden. How bad was that? Aitor, <laughs> listen, my last name is Womack, and you wouldn't believe how many ways people have mispronounced that. I got introduced as Walmart one time. <laughs> we are so glad to have you all with us and all of you visiting and listen if you haven't before just an opportunity if you have not filled out a welcome card in your attendance here with us we would love to have a record of your attendance so please fill one of those out you can drop it in the offering plate in just a little while we also want to get a sense of uh, anyone who might be interested in this point of becoming a member at Bay Presbyterian Church. You may have been attending for some time and perhaps would consider joining with us to be members. So if you would take one of those cards and just put your name down and jot interested in membership and put that in the plate, then we can schedule a dinner coming up. And uh, that's right, there's food involved. You should know that. Not that we're trying to bribe you, but whatever it takes. Uh, and let us know that you're interested and we'll get something scheduled in the near term. Just a reminder to you that we do have Sunday school that meets each week in the Fellowship Hall with Dr. Greg Poland as teacher. Uh, Y'all got through all the Ten Commandments today? Oh. oh, okay, okay. Well, at least we established that much. So please feel free to be a part of Sunday School. And also, of course, we have refreshments. We've got coffee and some uh, items outside the double glass doors there. Ladies Luncheon coming up this Wednesday. Ladies, if you're interested in uh, coming to the luncheon, please see Rachel. Let her know that you're coming. Uh, that's all you have to do. That's the only requirement. Just uh, let us know you plan to attend. Make sure there's plenty of room for everybody. And a reminder to our elders that we do have a session meeting on Tuesday at two in the afternoon and for the rest of you so you can pray for your elders as we meet together. John Anderson is away from us this morning. He is up at Westminster Church in Fort Myers filling the pulpit so we're grateful for the opportunity he has and the blessing that we know he is to that congregation. Uh, Kathy is out of town. She is with her mother in Danville who is uh, struggling with um, a compression fracture in her spine and Kathy has had to stay up there and will be there until Thursday or so so Honey, I miss you. I would rather have you here than there, but I know where you're where you need to be. So blessings to you and to sweet Mimi as we're, well, our family, we just do whatever it takes. So that we will continue to do. I think that's all I have. Does anybody know anything? I don't see hands wildly waving, Bill or Rachel or Greg or anyone. So as we uh, are here today, grateful in our hearts for what God has done for us through his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are here today, not just in the presence of each other, but in the presence of the one true and living God who has provided for us above and beyond anything we could ask or think through Christ Jesus, his son. So church, let's prepare to worship our good and gracious God.
This is the call to worship. You can find the responsive reading in the inside front cover of your bulletin. Luke 1, 46 to 50. My soul praises the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. His mercy extends to those who hear him from generation to generation. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Let us worship. Indeed, let us worship God as we stand together, if you're able, and sing together to God be the glory. Stand with me. Let us invite God into our worship together. Mighty and merciful God, our creator, king, and redeemer, we humbly come before your divine presence, recognizing your sovereignty over all creation. We come together as a community of believers, seeking your divine wisdom and grace to lead us on this, our journey of faith. God, our Father, we acknowledge our sins and transgressions, and we earnestly repent, seeking your forgiveness and cleansing. Strengthen us with the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray, that we may walk in righteousness and bear witness to your redeeming love. Lord Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, we exalt your holy name and proclaim your absolute and once-for-all victory over sin and death. 
Guide us as we strive to share your gospel with a world in desperate need of salvation. Make us instruments of your peace, compassion, and reconciliation that through us, others may come to know your saving grace. As we gather, Heavenly Father, let your presence fill this place. and May your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Grant us discernment and understanding that we may understand your will and follow it faithfully. We pray, Lord, in your precious name, believing that you hear and answer our prayers, even as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. is the reading of the word of God. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O oh, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, 
his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. We have the ushers come forward. Gracious and generous God, we come before you with hearts overflowing with gratitude and with quiet joy, acknowledging that all we have is a blessing from your very hand. As we present our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings, we do so with a spirit of worship and of obedience. Accept these gifts, Heavenly Father as tokens of our love and devotion to you. May they be used to further your kingdom, to bring hope to the hopeless, and to extend your love to those far away who desperately need your redemption. Bless each giver, Lord, and abundantly so, for you promise to bless those who give cheerfully. Open the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings beyond measure upon them in their household. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being stewards of your resources. May we use them wisely and in alignment with your will, always seeking to bring glory and honor to your name here in Southwest Florida, our country, and indeed all the nations. In Jesus' name, we make our prayer. my very favorites this is my father's world and so as we worship our heavenly father let us be still and know that he is god let's stand together and sing Thank uh-huh. 
you will, in your bulletin, take out the sheet that lists our prayer concerns, as I have the great privilege to pray for you. Lord Jesus, we are gathered as a fellowship of believers, earnestly seeking your face, Lord. For there are many concerns, Lord, fears and anxieties over ourselves, our health, our brother, our sister, and those whom we love. Lord, we ask that you would protect our members of the military and their families. We ask that you would protect all of those who attend to our health and welfare, first responders, doctors, nurses, pharmacists. And Lord, we pray specifically for those in our fellowship. Lord, my heart is anxious for Ron Kellams. Would you be pleased to touch this dear brother, this servant of yours? Lord, both of our pastor's mothers are in need of your healing touch. Would you be pleased to do so? Would you bring John and Carrie and Kathy back to us safely in your good timing? Lord, there are those among us, I heard even this morning, who will be traveling and in some cases to distant lands. Would you send your angels camp around them to give them safety and Lord may they have the privilege and opportunity of sharing your word with those who perhaps have never heard it or at least never attended to it Father we stand in great need in great need Lord of your cleansing of your presence Lord, for this fellowship, I pray that every person here would feel your arms around them. And that small voice that says, I'm here, and I will never let you go. Lord, in a few moments of silence, will you now hear the prayers of your people? our prayers are heard by you and that whether we see it or see it in the way we want to see it your answer to our prayers is perfect and we cling to that hope and that promise Lord and all of God's people here said Amen Thank you doctor these doctors around I may have told you before but I heard the story years ago and I think Billy Graham told it about a farmer who put his mule in the Kentucky Derby they said uh, you don't have any idea he's going to win that Derby do you and he said oh no but look at the company he'll be in <laughs> I know how that mule felt. <laughs> Grateful for good folks to serve alongside, or at least try not to get in the way too much. Next Sunday, I'm sort of pulling rank. Today, around 11 o'clock, Texas Daylight Savings Time, our son Joe is going to be preaching at Christ Community Church. And then he and his family are going to be flying here next Saturday. I don't get to hear him preach in person. So next Sunday, he's going to preach here in this pulpit. So, you know, 
I get a chance to hear good sermons every once in a while from Greg and John and son Joe. So I uh, hope you'll allow that, and I know we'll all be blessed. Now, to another doctor, Luke, the beloved physician, in his gospel narrative as we come to chapter 8, and we'll be looking at verses 40 through 56. Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. I'm going to read this, and then we'll consider it together. But as I read, please know, this is the word of God. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. And as the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of the Lord stands forever. This is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Amen. Well, I don't know about accurately rendering this in English, but Hippocrates apparently said extreme remedies are very appropriate for extreme diseases. The world has translated that to apply it to general matters to say desperate times require desperate measures. Theodore Roosevelt said simply do what you can with what you've got where you are. There's a sense in all of this in which human beings are saying, do the best you can with what you've got. Some issues and matters require more effort, require more attention than others. And yet, sooner or later, we come to the limit of our ability. We simply are able to go no further than our abilities allow us to go. But it is the Lord Jesus who said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And so we're dealing with a Savior who has all power, who has the ability to do what others cannot do. Indeed, that's why we trust in him. That's why we're here worshiping today, because we understand and know that God has provided for us through his Son as he has through no one else. So Jesus returns after having gone across the Sea of Galilee or the Lake Gennesaret after that tremendous storm came up. And he demonstrated his power over the storm by saying, peace be still. And everything became quiet. He demonstrated his power and dominion over the satanic world as he cast the demons out of those 
poor wretches who had them. Luke tells us about one individual. We know that there were two. Jesus demonstrated his power, and yet he was not wanted there because having cast those demons into swine, those swine plunged into the water and were drowned. They wanted him to leave them, and so he comes back across the lake, and upon returning, he was welcomed there. They were all waiting for him. There's a tremendous crowd. We don't know how many people are there. This uh, Jesus, by this point, has something like what we would call in our modern vernacular rock star status. Word about him is spread. People are fascinated. Everybody's coming. Who is this? What's he going to do next? All kinds of interest attended his ministry. But in the middle of all this, someone comes, and not just anybody, but Jairus, who is a ruler in the synagogue where he lives in this area. A man of profound importance, a man whose standing and status would not have him going to somebody else in the first place and certainly not falling down at his feet. Desperate times require desperate measures. For this man, regardless of his standing, had a daughter who had a profound need. This determined father disregarded his reputation for his dying daughter's sake. And so, casting aside all convention, falls at the feet of Jesus, deeming him to be the one person in all the world who could help in this terrible circumstance. One daughter, about 12, and she was dying. We've all been there. We know what it's like to face that time when we see that medical science has done all that it can do, and it's only a matter of time. And we have all seen those who have gone through this experience, and we all, at some point or other, whether it's a child or whether it's someone else close to us, have said something like, if there was only something I could do, I can remember clearly when our son had his disseminated staph infection. Before he turned that corner and began to recover, those three long, dark weeks in intensive care, and in the middle of the night, somewhere around 2 a.m., I remember crying with tears running down my face, Lord, take me. Someone, please intervene. I get the desperation in this father's heart, and I know you do too. And so Jesus went. That's what we would expect. He responds. Then things begin to get interesting here as we're wondering what in the world happens. Jesus is interrupted by someone who just touches the hem of his garment, and he stops. And ask the question, who touched me? This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is God omniscient and omnipotent. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not like me being in a crowd. I've, you've been in a crowd before too. People pressing around. Think of yourself at a, at a football game or a concert when people are crowding all around. And, and you stop and say, somebody touched me. Who didn't touch me? I mean, I want to go home and, you know, and. Take a bath and alcohol. I mean, everybody's touching. It is a curious moment, isn't it? That Jesus stops and he will not proceed any further until he's able to allow this woman to say, I did it. She, of course, is in a desperate circumstance. On the one hand, you have a daughter that is about the age of 12. And yet for 12 years, this woman has had this issue of blood. She spent everything she could and everything she had on on physicians. And remember, Luke is the one recording this. I wonder what his pen did as he was writing. Okay, they tried their best, I suppose. But this was uh, was in a time when uh, the art of medicine had a lot more to do with art than medicine. And she got no help at all. Can't you see her there? It seems everybody in the world is pressing in to Jesus. If only I could get to him, she's thinking. If 
If only I could just reach out and touch him. If, if only. Somehow she discerned in her heart, this is the one hope I have. And she's trying desperately to get there. And somehow she comes up behind him. You see, she wants the healing power of Jesus, but she doesn't want to make a show of it. She, uh, she doesn't in any way want attention drawn to her. But yet she reaches him. And just grasping the hem of the garment, it's enough. And immediately she's made well. Tim Keller has said, this is something akin to malpractice. Jesus stops to attend to a woman who has a chronic condition and fails to continue on to the one who has an acute condition. I hope I'm getting these words right. I'm way out of my element here, doctor. But you get the meaning. This woman has been living with for 12 years with this, uh, with this ailment. She can wait. The daughter is dying. It is a desperate moment. And yet Jesus stops. I want to suggest to you that the Lord Jesus does not, does not ask who touched me so that we can wonder and offer all kinds of conjecture about how his divine nature is interacting with his human nature. I've read plenty this week of commentators who are offering all kinds of ideas and notions about that, how that perhaps in his human form the Lord Jesus didn't know who touched him and it is a mystery to us, and at other times he even knows what people are thinking. Why did he not know who touched him in this moment? I just leave all that to the realm of mystery. God tells us what we need to know. I think what's clear is that Jesus asks the question not for his own benefit, but for hers. You see, she touched him. Jesus wants, first of all, for her to acknowledge that publicly and for him to be able to acknowledge to her that it was her faith that made her well. One thing is true, among many other things, coming to the Lord Jesus and exercising true faith in him means that we have to recognize our helpless condition. Helplessness. We are not floundering on the surface of the water just in need of a little assistance. Somebody to come along and edge us over toward shore or just to cast out a life preserver and pull us in. We are in desperate straits. There is no one else who can get us out of this dilemma. As I say to you so often, nobody can extricate you out of the mess you're in. Only the Lord Jesus can do that. And we see time and time again in Scripture this need to sense that helplessness, that there is no one else. And when you get to that point of thinking, there is no one who can help me, you may feel like you're in a tunnel with no light at the end of it, but you are at just the right position to be able to cast your eyes upward and see the one who can rescue you. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. The Lord God promises in Psalm 50, verse 15. The Lord Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say, Blessed are the self-actualized, you know, those who made it to the top of Maslow's Pyramid. That's not what he said. That's what we would expect him to say. Oh, if only I can build up my self-esteem to the point that I feel good about myself, then I can enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus never said that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, down at the bottom of Maslow's pyramid, desperate for need, unable to find it when I look within myself. But when I look, when I look to him, oh, I see in him that help and rescue that God's provided for while we were still helpless at the right time Christ died for the ungodly do you get a sense of what I'm saying this woman had no one else to turn to Jairus had no one else to turn to and don't worry by the way about Jesus stopping to deal with the chronic condition and ignoring the acute one Jairus went to Jesus asking for healing He's going to get far more than that because Jesus is in no wise impeded by the circumstances of the moment. Even death is no encumbrance to him. 
And we can be assured of that when it comes to our own salvation. Because what we see is that God patiently operates according to his own schedule without consulting ours. <laughs> Maybe you're not like me, but I've got my own timetable. I've worked it out very carefully. I've spent a lot of time thinking it through with logic, with study and contemplation about how this world and particularly my part of it should operate and God seldom conforms himself to it. I don't understand it. It is a well thought out schedule and timetable. Jairus had an understanding of how the Lord ought to respond to him and it doesn't tell us what his thinking is here but you know, we're people. We all can understand. Probably there, it was all he could do probably to restrain himself from grabbing the Lord by the arm and saying, come on. How many of us have wanted to reach out and grab his arm and say, come on. I'm dying here. My loved one is dying here. On the other hand, I also know this. If God suddenly started accommodating himself to my schedule or yours or all the rest of the billions of people in the world, can you imagine the utter chaos that would result? No, we can't. It would be worse than our imaginations can carry us. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, as Peter, who witnessed this and so much more of our Lord's life, revealed in his second letter, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, as the Lord, in his governance of all things, abides by his own schedule, he accomplishes far greater than anything we can imagine with our own futile attempt at thinking through what he ought to be doing. And when Jesus says, who touched me, suddenly this woman has opportunity to explain her circumstances and say, I did, I touched him. What's she doing? That whole crowd is there. She is bearing witness and testimony to the healing power of Jesus Christ. She is bearing witness and confessing with her mouth what Jesus has done for her and in doing that, Christ is able to affirm her and say, your faith has healed you. It's not superstition. It's not some good luck charm. It is faith that has made you well. And in affirming that, she goes on her way knowing that she has a Savior who will carry her through all the rest of her life and for eternity. Can't you see her there trembling, falling down, declaring in the presence of all, I did it. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Faith. Faith exercised, placed in Christ in a desperate time. And the Lord doing an extraordinary thing. And in the meantime, the little child has died. Word comes. Word comes to Jairus. Don't bother the master anymore. She's gone. You see, in what little bit of understanding they had, they were able to attribute healing power to the Lord Jesus. They, they felt like he would be able to deliver her from whatever sickness she's had. But once death comes, there's no hope for deliverance from that. Ah, uh, but how we fail to reckon and consider the one who has come in the form of human flesh. This one who says, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. Christ able to do far more. Death being no encumbrance to him. Coming to the house, he excludes all others. The mom and dad are there. Peter, John, James, that's all that are in the room. There's weeping, there's mourning, 
and he says, don't weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. Here is a Savior. When we think of death being final, and there's absolutely nothing you can do for anybody after that, for Jesus, death is no more than sleep. It's no more than waking somebody up from slumber. That's the power of deity dwelling in him bodily so that he is able to utter that. What's their response? The natural one. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure, right. That's my paraphrase. Sure. Yeah. Whatever. We simply fail to reckon ourselves to the power of God. He takes her by the hand and he calls out, Child, arise. He speaks to her. Why would he speak to her? She's dead. She can't hear a thing. Well, when the Creator speaks, even inanimate matter responds. Her spirit returns. She gets up. No other outcome possible. We've crossed this bridge before, and we've talked about that previously. When the Lord commands, there's no other possible response than obedience on the part of the earth. Having spoken, let there be in the beginning, there was. And now that he says, get up, she did once. She even ate. And suddenly everyone is astounded. You see in the Lord Jesus among the things that are united we have the divine nature the human nature which is a mystery to us but he is both God and man but we also see gloriously coupled together both loving care and this astoundingly awesome power that he possesses. Mark tells us in chapter 5, verse 40, 41, he actually gives us the little Aramaic expression that Jesus utters for good reason. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum. Now, that may not mean much to you. You say, well, we've already got the translation. Why did Mark include that? Because it really is a phrase that doesn't come across well in our language. It's a, it's a diminutive expression, and it perhaps could be rendered something along the lines of, sweetie. of kindness and love there that we dare not miss. So this one who possesses all power has this loving care and concern. And it reminds us of what Mark says elsewhere in chapter 10. As, Mark, as Matthew also records for us in Matthew 19, they were bringing children to him that he might touch them and the disciples rebuked them. You know, they're looking out for the master. He's got important work to do. Get these children away. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of God. And suddenly he teaches them a life lesson. These children are important. These, these children that were deemed to be little more than, than troublesome and even thought to be property by many. Jesus gives them dignity and says, let them come. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. All power coupled with this glorious loving kindness, this gentleness, so that we can come to the one who has all power as he has beckoned us because he is gentle and lowly. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, For he was crucified in weakness, but lived by the power of God. In his supposed weakness, we see the strength of God. The world looks at him crucified on a cross, and they think if he had all power, it would have never come to that. But that's just the point. He laid aside that power. What was it when the woman with the issue of blood touched him? He said, I sense that the power has gone out of me. Don't you see that in that moment, Jesus was willing to give up in order that she might have? And that he, with each of us, is willing to lay down and give up in order that we might have in his weakness. He laid aside all the rights and privileges of deity. 
that we might have what he purchased for us on the cross. That's the faith we're called to exercise in utter helplessness, looking at him and understanding and knowing. There's my one source of hope. There is the one who can heal. There is the one who can deliver me from death. Because when I die in Christ, it's no more than sleep. Some of you know because you've heard me talk about it, but uh, and I've done a couple of things on Facebook. You know, grief is a funny thing, isn't it? As a pastor, just as a human being, I've had to deal with loss now for these 56 years. And I don't know why. Some things just hit me harder than others, and I find myself wondering, why is this one so hard? At General Assembly this past summer, I was there with our son Joe as commissioners and as I've told you. But while we were there, we were at the MTW luncheon, and, you know, they had me seated up front. They're putting me out to pasture because I'm done as chairman. So it was sort of the last two raw. I got to sit up there with the coordinator. Remember what I started with, the mule and the Kentucky Derby? There I was. <laughs> but being up front, people were able to see a little better, and so people were coming up nicely speaking. But among the people who came up and spoke was Charlie Stakely, my seminary roommate. Charlie and I had showed up 34 years ago outside of Gerald Morgan's office, who was the dean of students at Reform Seminary, and coach. We call him coach because uh, he had been Archie Manning's high school football coach at Mendenhall, Mississippi. So we figured we ought to call him coach, too. He said, you boys need to get to know each other because you're going to be roommates. And we were for the next three years. Charlie had gone to the University of Alabama. He knew Bear Bryant. His dad was good friends with the bear. One of Charlie's earliest memories was seeing the bear outside of a restaurant where they had just eaten with him. And little Charlie, looking up at this man that looked like he was eight feet tall, standing there, and all these flash bulbs were going off, and Bear was just kind of straightened, you know, just. And Charlie saw it, so he always had a poster of Bear Bryant in his room and always kidding him. I said, sure you don't want me to get you a candle that you can keep lit on the top of your bureau under the bear's picture. He had graduated from Alabama. He had gone on to Cumberland Law School and was a successful attorney with a successful practice in Birmingham. But under the ministry of Dr. Frank Barker at the Briarwood Presbyterian Church, he felt the call to gospel ministry. And so he left behind his law practice and came to seminary and ended up rooming with a hillbilly who had never been out of the mountains for more than two weeks in his life. We were. And in recent years, we've sort of fallen out of touch. We see each other every once in a while and speak. But, I mean, we were tight in seminary, and I'm so grateful for those years. And, you know, he was instrumental in Kathy and I being together. You know, he was head of the singles program at the church we attended, and Kathy had a boyfriend. That's no encumbrance when your friend is Charlie Stakely. We went bowling a good bit, and somehow the boyfriend always wound up on the far end of the bowling alley, and Kathy was always in my lane. <laughs> and so at General Assembly, when we were there with our kids, Charlie always had a way of coming up and looking at my kids and saying, you know, I'm responsible for you. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. And we'd laugh about that. And so we saw each other in that moment, got to speak. I got a last-second picture with him. He called me Thursday a week ago, and we talked in there on the phone for nearly an hour, catching up on so many things. And he said, uh, I know this is late to be calling. He said, but I was just kind of wondering if you could come be a missions conference speaker for me. And I said, sure. I thought, late calling. This is going to be sometime next month. And he said, I'm looking at March. I said, Charlie, I'm so much in demand, I don't even have a 2024 calendar. <laughs> But when I get one, I'm going to write your name on it. What dates are we talking about? And we talked and we laughed. And then Wednesday, I got a phone call. Mr. Womack, this is uh, Mackie Stakely, McKay Stakely. And I said, oh, man, McKay, I haven't heard you since your voice changed. And I bantered with him for a moment, and he said, uh, I was just looking down through my dad's contact list in his phone and I saw your name my dad died this morning he 
You know, Charlie was so competitive. Didn't matter what we were doing, basketball, tennis, golf. I didn't play those things, but he was always competitive. I just suddenly had this image. One of these days when I get to heaven, I'm going to see that dry smile on his face, and he's going to say, hey, it's good to see you, but you know I got here first. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought, why? After all these years we reconnected, I was so looking forward to going up to Evans, Georgia, outside of Augusta. He was talking about how he was going to put me in a house right next to the golf course. I said, Charlie, I don't play golf, but can I get out there and shoot skeet? looking forward to it and suddenly he's gone and I was reminded again that God has his own timetable and he does all things well well I've taken far more time in telling that than I should have for some reason this has hit me harder than other things but you know not for one second have I lost hope because I know in our weakness God has demonstrated his strength that in the giving of his son he has provided for us everlasting life Charlie and I committed to each other in those days so long ago now having listened to a number of chapel speakers and people say a lot of things in ministry he and I committed to each other that any time we would stand at a venue like this from a pulpit like this whatever we were talking about that we proclaim the gospel and I listened to his last message and like an attorney arguing before the bar he was seeking to persuade his congregation that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except by him and that's all I am saying and will continue to try to say to you is to point you and me to the Lord Jesus. Our means of rescue. Death is no encumbrance to him. And however long you or I have on this earth, we can be confident in knowing that he has all power. And when we die, it is merely a moment when our spirit departs the body. Sleep ensues he will raise us up on the last day the body sleeps the spirit is with him we'll be alive far better off than we've ever been in that intermediate state but Christ is our all powerful savior and that power is coupled with a loving care and kindness like you've never known so that we can flee to him know that he will welcome us he has done everything necessary for us so Jairus saw it so the woman who was bleeding saw it the crowd had the opportunity to see and now I proclaim to you may God be praised Father in heaven we thank you O Lord for a savior who does all things well for gracious father you are the one who has loved us having created us in your image you've provided for us so wonderfully through your son Grant to us, O Lord, that we by faith may look to Jesus. Whether today is the day that you have opened someone's eyes and drawn them to Christ so that this is that first confession or whether it's a reminder perhaps of something that happened decades ago, Lord bless us that we might continue on trusting in the Savior, making confession of him before others, that in our helplessness, you have provided rescue. Lord, we praise you. Accomplish your good work. Your word has been read, and however feebly it has been preached, let it not return Accomplish that for which you have sent it this day. Not for any recognition of the one who speaks or any one of us seated here, but for the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's stand and
And so may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up unto you his countenance and give you his peace. Both now and forever.